one of the uh, researchers at the center, Danny Feldenstein, wrote me an email, and with it, with you know our ac acronym, telling me something about it, and I started looking it up because I was too embarrassed to say, Danny, what is this acronym? And then I realized that it was <coughs> the initials of our new center. I'm supposed to. Okay, can we start, Michal? Yes, we can start. Okay, let me introduce Kevin Fleming. Kevin completed his BS in honors at the University of New England, Australia. I didn't know that they had New England in Australia. Beautiful area. And a Master of Applied Science at the Western Australian School of Mines. After working as an exploration geophysicist, he undertook a Master of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge and then worked as an environmental geophysicist in Sydney. After doctoral studies at the Australian National University, he went to the GFZ in Potsdam as a postdoctoral researcher and then research project manager. He was a researcher at Curtin University in Perth, Australia, before returning to the GFZ as a project manager and senior researcher. His current research interests include multi-type hazard and risk assessment and developing scenario training concepts. Kevin. Okay. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you, uh, Mikhail, for arranging this and to everybody for coming to this talk and to my support team. Thank you very much. Um, today I'm going to speak about as the title suggests, scenario-based exercises for disaster risk management information illustration. And it's insights from what we've developed from two European-supported projects, Sensum and Espresso. A uh, point I need to mention straight away is that with regards to developing these exercises, especially within the Espresso team. What, what is Espresso and Sensum you will find stand it. for? Okay. It will be answered. Okay. Don't want to spoil it. Sorry. Um, we, none of us are specifically scenario plan designers. One of our colleagues is actually, his hobby is actually these sort of board games that people do. And strangely, that's helped us a lot. But I'll be very, I know Deborah has mentioned that they're, you're involved in scenario training exercises. And this is something with, you know, your input, well, um, criticisms. Yeah, no, not this group. Oh. I mean, maybe somebody is, so, but I don't. Okay. No. So we're really interested in your input. Now, understanding disaster risk management. I mean, as everybody this table will know, it's a very complex interaction between. I'm turn off the it's a little light. This is complex. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Just one light on the other side. It's a complex interaction between mitigating, assessing what your hazard or risk will be, actually responding, planning. It's, it involves a vast variety of expertise and um, a number of different actors in the whole scheme. Uh, for example, if you're assessing, okay, you've got to identify your hazard, identify the vulnerability and the exposure of all, all elements of concern. That in itself is a difficult question when you start thinking, well, what are we concerned about? Are you concerned about your know, just the structural environment, the built environment? What about intangible assets? The mitigation, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to do it? And do we know how to do it? Uh, responsibility, this is always good fun. Who is going to do it, as in you, our response? Who is going to decide who is going to do it? And most importantly, who's going to pay for it? And communication, and this is often a big problem. Yeah. Who talks to who? Who wants to talk to who? And how do different parties, different groups actually communicate with each other? Um, and basically, what I'll be discussing is or proposing ways in which how do we find these answers and how do we improve upon a current situation? Now, why scenarios? Uh, in the Sensum project, which I'll describe in detail later, one of our colleagues made the comment that Often when people, you know, he uh, wants to ask, you know, that was within the context, I think, of a, a recovery project that they had several years before. And they would ask <laughs> stakeholders, right, what information do you want? And they would either answer, you know, well, what do you have? Or, well, give us everything. Which uh, the fellow in question started finding somewhat unsatisfactory. And so we decided to try basically scenarios or role-playing exercises. 
And yes, Dungeons and Dragons, that game some of you might have wasted your youth on, is being alluded to. There are some analogies towards it. Um, why do we? Why was this decided upon? In one way, it's not passive. It's not like just getting a questionnaire and you fill out forms. You you are actually engaged in the exercise. It's interactive, so between the participants, you know, the questioning itself has a potential to evolve, and it's just more fun. Simply, you actually are interacting. However, it's also got the additional bonus that you might have a certain issue you're dealing with, but then other points arise, which is actually can be often the more interesting part to discuss. And yes, you know, your insights from your own exercises will be of great interest. Now, what I mean by scenarios, just very quickly, mean by scenarios, in my reading of the literature, there seems to be an awful lot written about something that I thought we all knew what it was. But I'm just using the um, Shomak definition here. Uh, scenarios described as a tool for ordering one's perceptions about alternative future environments in which one's decisions might be played out. Um, fairly straightforward. Basically, it basically involves dealing with an event. Okay, earthquake happened here. Pop. That's the scenario. Or um, we're predicting increased droughts in this area. How do we respond? Or even you might have a certain policy engaged. You, that could be considered a scenario. Now, from this, our scenario training exercises, you divide it up basically between scenario planning, or how I understand in the literature, scenario planning and scenario building. Scenario planning is, if you like, referring to the process of creating the exercise of investigating proposed situations or environments. Uh, the whole point is, as we've got here, learning, challenging, thinking, and testing protocols. Um, if you like, it's the exercise. Scenario building, from my understanding, is if you like the story. You know, you have a story of, we've got X, an earthquake happened in Tel Aviv yesterday. That's the story. The planning is how we actually design the exercise to respond to that. Um, in the exercises I'm talking about, we're mainly concerned with scenario planning. And the exercises I'll be talking about are within two projects, Sensum and Espresso. Now, the Sensum project, it was uh, within what's called the FP European framework, FP7, which is the previous one. Um, just a few details. It was, well, it was actually by European standards, a small project, 2.4 million euros, uh, only a two-year project. Uh, GFZ was the coordinating uh, institution. I was the manager of this project. And we had quite a wide variety of groups. We had uh, EU Centre in Pavia. Uh, ImageCat is a SME based in England. And we had the Turgis, um, the Tajik Institute for Engineering Geology, the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute, University of Cambridge, the German Space Centre, and the Central Asian Institute for Applied Geosciences in Bishkek. The aim of Sensum was we were looking at the application and integration of remote sensing and ground-based methods for multi-risk analysis. Uh, basically, we wanted to address what space technologies could be applicable to disaster recovery and just general response. We wanted to apply various tools developed within the project specifically to earthquakes and landslides. Uh, that was our primary interest. Uh, all the tools we're developing are free and open source, so they're being provided to the civil protection disaster risk reduction communities. And we also wanted to enhance the scientific and technical capacities of our Central Asian partners. And these are the two main parts that fit in with the scenario training exercises. Our end users and stakeholders were the Ministry of Emergency Situations in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Uh, the civil protection in Ankara and Izmir in Turkey, and the governor's office in Izmir. Now, the scenario training tool that was developed within Sensum, we call the game. Forgive the original name, but it was developed by Cambridge Architectural Research in response to these concerns about not being able to find out exactly what people want. Um, basically, the idea of it was to assess First of all, to assess the context of how much the, the participants in this exercise, how much they actually knew about remote sensing technologies. Did they know what sort of products were available? 
And we also wanted to try to identify indicators from the exercise that could be useful, what they would want. Yeah, this is what we're trying to find out. Uh, basically, in the specific issues we're concerned with is the timing, the resolution of the information, the accuracy of the data, and unfortunately, again, most of all important, the cost. Now, the, partic the participants, well, usually senior civil protection managers, divided into three groups. Event generators, they basically, within the exercise, they inform the other participants that something happened. We would have a list, if you like, a script of, well, this event happened, this event happened, this event happened. Uh, the decision makers, they would respond to the events and say, okay, what do we do? And their job was to make requests to the information providers who would then provide the suggest, and they would also suggest what information they would require. And this is one part, if you like, which is related to the products of the remote sensing. Um, basically, what we would do is we would have a predefined disaster, an earthquake, give the information, this is what happened, this is how big it was. One could make these exercises very complex, like one earthquake, or you could do what we've done in a student exercise, get very nasty and throw in cascading effects and broken nuclear reactors and everything. Um, and also, as in the Dungeons and Dragons, Dragons exercise, the main adjudicator of the exercise could throw in a, if you like, a wild card every so often, like, okay, now you've got riots. Oh, now there's a presidential decree. So just to keep the thinking going. Uh, we divided it into these exercises themselves are what I wasn't a part of. I wasn't part of a teaching exercise that we did for a training course. Uh, we basically divided it up into 30-minute sections and they were devoted to your first day after a crisis first week first month first year two years plus and the intention there was to follow the whole response recovery and then mitigation cycle uh, normally we did it over two days the first day were introductory lectures as to what the project was what this was about how we want you to perform what sort of products and that we're offering um, but it could also be done and the next day was the exercise but then again, for a training exercise we did with this training course, um, it was like a half day session. So you could make this as complex or as simple as possible as you want. Uh, the participants, again, were senior managers. They represent high level decision makers and also senior technical people. Now, it, there was an operational element to this project, as in, yes, you know, how it can be used. However, we weren't really aiming to test your procedures. It wasn't like, you know, we want to see if doing X is better than doing Y. It was, you know, what information would help you do your job. Um, as we mentioned, information elicitation. For the training course, actually, it was simply an exercise to help develop critical thinking. And that was a lot of fun. That was great. What we would do is we would have... Um, you know, a great deal of material produced. One lot were these event flashcards where literally a card we put on go, right, you've now had a landslide. If you like, it's sort of help a visual presentation of what's happening. And below here, you see here, a um, basically it was like a table sheet where people would put, as cards happen, they would write their decisions out, they would write the requests for the information and so forth. There was also the information flashcards saying, okay, what was the event um, using in this case we use the US pager as the example and building damage what the extent of damage was and that information would be provided in terms of how we wanted to see how the remote sensing information was can't read that I'm sorry but take my word for it this is um, different aspects of remote sensing data uh, if you like from the less detailed to the more detailed hence more time is required to produce this information. It's also more expensive. But it's also basically the idea judged that the participants would look at this information and think, right, we don't need detailed information here. Give us this. That might be the first day, as one would expect. In the first week, first month, okay, we need to know more detail, and you would request this information. They had a limited resources they were allowed to spend, tokens or whatever, and so they had to prioritize what the information they could provide. And basically, the sort of things we would have, we divide it up into these different sections. There's the hazard information. You could actually, if you like, for example, a hazard, 
You could improve the uh, resolution of your hazard maps. Uh, for camp locations, you could use remote sensing data to identify where the different camps were that people established, which was something I found surprising. I thought when UN response groups set up a emergency camp, they knew exactly what it was, but apparently that's not the case. Um, the built environment, you know, what's, what's the vulnerability of the built environment? Can we assess more, you know, from different remote sensing data? So as you can imagine, these different types of things will require more time, more immediate use or less use. Now, what did it reveal? Uh, basically, it was what we hoped. We saw the interplay between the different participants uh, was far more, you know, more, they could gain more from it than just sitting there and reading a questionnaire, people returned. Uh, the exercise allowed different responses. Also, it identified problems, like for example, what data is not available, one of the features of this, I won't talk much about what the final results were, but for example, it was very dependent on the experience of the participants. For example, our Bishkek colleagues, they weren't as experienced with what remote sensing information is available. So in a way, they didn't really know what to ask for, whereas our Turkish colleagues, they were more familiar with what is available. And so, oh, okay, we'll use this, we'll use this, we'll use this. Uh, the information employed you know, as I mentioned, it's depending on the experience of the participants. What we found was that there was a clear discontinuity when they started looking, they worked up that one year, then apparently after, when they started looking at longer periods, the participants started getting a bit bored, not as interested, didn't really care. Basically, that was a product of the people we had were responders. You know, they were right, let's fix a disaster, let's start recovering. But then the longer term plan, that wasn't their job. So what this emphasized is that we need, to, in hindsight, it made us think more carefully about who we should invite to such exercises. Now, what sort of things can these exercises reveal? This is the part I found really interesting. Um, cultural aspects, for example, in Bishkek, all the Kyrgyz and Tajik colleagues, they have a very military response. All the guys are like ex-military. I think the Minister for Emergency Situations is a general. Um, and it's very hierarchical. You know, basically, they have the standard procedures, rules of thumb, go out, do the job. Um, and they do it very well. Um, but then this brings up certain things, like, for example, general attitudes to hierarchy. One example the guys made the comment was they were swapping some of the roles around. And there was one fellow who was within the organisation, a lower rank, than the other fellow, but in the exercise, the roles were reversed. And he had a lot of trouble actually taking part because, no, no, but he's my boss, I can't. So these cultural issues sort of came up. I'll talk a little bit more later. Gender participation, if you look at the pictures of the people taking part, they were all men in Bishkek, well, in the Turks, it was about 50-50. How many people were involved? In about 18. 18? 18 people per exercise. About six in the three groups, about six, six each. And you feel a break between one of the scenarios or you can debrief it or how do you... Uh, it, the debriefing was at the end. At the end. And yeah, you would basically do the whole day. So you have day one, um, no, right, day one, you talk, plan, end, cup of coffee. You go then? Then go to the next. There was quite funny. One part was also how people get um, a bit too focused. There was one part where... I think it was a, forget which period, but when you read the, the report, our deliverable that describes this, it was very funny. It goes, it was announced that the dam on this river was was um, in danger of collapsing. The group broke for lunch. Um, what happened was, it was sort of like, problem, problem. Oh, the dam's going to break. Okay, we'll get to that. Um, problem. Yeah, it was slight, those sort of things arise. Um, it also allows you help, okay, the actual knowledge of what information was available. And it was well, just general knowledge, general training. If you haven't had much experience with remote sensing, it might be difficult. You might not, gee, I didn't know this was available. How set are the response protocols and how flexible? Again, the Turkish group were possibly more flexible in how to respond. The Kyrgyz, that more military, top-down viewpoint, perhaps not. And communication, communication, communication. These were the issues that were coming up. Who could communicate with who? The Espresso Project 
on the other hand, uh, was much more political. Uh, it was with the latest group, Horizon 2020, and it's currently being led by AMRA in, well, AMRA no longer exists, it's a bit complex, but it's the University of Naples. And so our group members here are GFZ, ETH Zurich, University of Copenhagen, BRGM in France, and University of Huddersfield. The aim of Espresso was, was quite different. It was to develop a strategic vision dealing with disaster risk reduction and climate change adaption. Basically building up, again, communication, communication, communication between different ministries, between different groups. Um, how can disaster risk reduction and climate change adaption, which often have totally different ministries, totally, you know, the researchers are different. How can they interact with each other? Especially when you consider you know, climate, if we have climate change, that's going to be changing your hazard. You know, these are obvious bedfellows, but how can we get the communication going? And part of it was uh, to investigate these the gaps in, in communication. So we did this by looking at three challenges. What, and I emphasize now, these are not the only problems, but you know, these are the ones we're looking at. The first was, okay, how do we have coherent national and European disaster risk reduction and climate change adaption regulations? The second was identifying schemes for bridging the gap between scientific and legal and policy issues at the national, local, and international levels. A big issue here is, for example, uncertainties. How do we communicate that? Um, here, communication of hazard and risk is you know, critical. And, you know, for example, L'Aquila is a classic example where people did everything wrong in terms of the communication. Well, a lot wrong. And the third was addressing issues around cross-border crises, again, at local, national, international levels. Our stakeholders were basically well, not quite as defined as in Sensum, but the representatives of civil protection authorities at different levels, developmental institutes and agencies, and more operational groups. We had some fire brigades, some fire, some police involved. Now, the espresso exercise, when we started the project, we had Sensum. And they said, okay, you guys can just make a new exercise. We thought, no problem. Easy. We can do it. No, very different. What we're looking at are quite not operational issues, which strangely is actually a lot hard, which operational ones are easier to do. These were more policy. And we had to try to get, you know, if you like, try to identify these gaps in policy between things. So we called it the risk assessment model simulation for emergency training exercise. Ramset, which apparently is Italian for Ramesses, for reasons I don't understand they wanted Ramesses. Uh, it was designed to explore these issues, the three challenges, and again took the role of a role-playing game. It was knowledge is illustration, basically based on the communication between the different participants. And we wanted to identify the issues, and especially those, again, with communication and policy. And as I mentioned, it was not operational, but was aiming at the higher level decision makers and planners. The general idea, if you like, is it was a journey rather than a destination. What the final decisions made during the exercise were, we didn't care. We want to know what your motivation was, why you couldn't make certain decisions and so forth. And because of the nature of these, we're going to end up with three quite different exercises, um, which adds to the work, but such is life. Um, <laughs> end up with a series of exercises. Basically, and what we've also found is that it's a, a range of disciplines. And so the role within the game is going to be very different to what their personal experience is. However, this we actually consider a positive point. We consider this enhances the richness of the exercise. When we test the exercises, we, well, I think, the, for example, the previous one, I would just grab people from my institute and come upstairs. I need to practice this. Here's chocolate. Um, one intern, she was very upset. She looked like, I don't know anything about this. I said, look, don't worry. You've been in this institute for a few months. You sort of know how we all think. And she did marvelously. There was no problem. She could really click into the thinking. So the fact that you have different people from different roles, we never found a problem. Um, in fact, we found it quite enriching. So, the, you know, in terms of the scenarios, what are we looking at? Um, what possibilities? Okay, increased in... Again, these are a bit more, you know, operationy or actual more physical aspects, but increased frequency, intensity of meteorological events, 
occurrence of hazards in areas with no history with regards to the science versus legal uncertainties. You know, that's a big issue, but also responsibility, you know, in case of false positives or negative. And for the transboundary issue, you know, we're looking at hazards that really directly affect a cross-border area and well, what indirect effects could have, trade and so forth. But this exercise were not on specific disaster. No. They were just general policy. General, we would. Okay. We would throw in a specific disaster. No, it wasn't just supposing it was like they call it. No, we would say, let's have an earthquake here. Um, what would happen? We would sort of fairly general. It was general. Um, but we would. No, question. Are you done? Yes. Um, did you look in this one only into cross-border um, policy making and problem solving, or did it work on the federal level, for example, Germany? Yes. How did Nordrhein-Westfalen? Okay, you got Köln. You can yeah. Have That's an excellent question. Thank you. No, it's very good. Okay. I'll jump ahead now and sort of explain something. What we did on purpose in these exercises, we didn't pick a specific country. We sort of, as we'll discover, we sort of invented our countries. Main reason is because, as was explained, say for example in Germany, it has a very strange uh, civil protection system. There's not, re it's a very federal system, and most responsibility is in the context of the municipalities. So there isn't like a, there is the national BBK national center, but the municipalities, the Lambers. So the states, not yes, the yeah. they um, we don't still haven't really worked out what BBK does, um, but it's really the responsibility of the Landers. And there was this fake meeting in the Italian embassy where we we're talking about earthquake early warning, and the BBK guy was there talking. We've got this plan to help this country and this plan to help that country, and someone asked, "Well, what happens if Germany needs help?" And they said, "Oh, we don't have a provision for that." Yeah. <laughs> We brought great amusement to the foreigners in the audience. Until I also discovered that France is the same. They don't have provision for foreigners to bring in to help. England is the same. They don't have provision, from my understanding, for outside assistance. The general belief is, oh, we can look after ourselves. So that is something you would look into? We did, sort of, but not specifically in the... Was, I re when we were doing that exercise, I really wanted to have a, you know, Switzerland, France, Germany, let's trash it and see what happens. But we ended up making up a scenario because you would have needed people familiar with the three countries' policies. That was getting a bit difficult. So, okay, let's simplify things. So the first exercise we did, we call Espresso Land, which we just, in all resemblance to Martinique is purely coincidental. So what we would do is we sort of invented, you know, Espresso Land, an island subject to natural hazards, yeah, I know the names, it's my fault. Nobody corrected me, so we just stick to it. Um, and we would then, basically, what we did is with this exercise is the overall aim was to enhance the well-being and social cohesion of Espresso Land. A point I should also refer back to this sensor exercise was we didn't really have any metrics. There was nothing at the end that said, oh, you did this better or you did this worse. In the Espresso exercise, we actually do have some metrics. You know, people can sort of learn, earn points. The player roles within this um, relatively small exercise with Ministry of Interior and Ministry for the Environment. Uh, okay, Interior was basically looking at disaster risk reduction capacity. Uh, environment was climate change. We had local government that was, you know, directly responsible for the citizens. Then we had scientific input for disaster risk reduction and climate change. The th the assumption we, we started this, which we subsequently worked out was not overly um, valid, but sort of not invalid, was we're concerned about silos. You know, the disaster scientists only talk to disaster scientists, climate change scientists only talk to climate change scientists, and so forth. And part of the exercise was to try to encut, break down these silos and get the communication going and find out where the gaps are. Uh, so we did this by different limitations. You know, for example, the scientists for disaster risk reduction could talk to the internal ministry, but they couldn't talk to the ministry for the environment. At the beginning, you could do actions that would break down these barriers. 
the metrics we used, one was shields, which we you, you can earn, you'll see how we earn these things. Shields represented uh, protection for um, disasters. The leaves were more related to climate change resilience. Handshakes, that was the one you're aiming for. That was the one that was social cohesion, social well-being. And the currency, beans. Uh, they were given allocated funds, and they could use these funds to what we call play these action cards. Uh, we would start with a tabletop. It was basically a tabletop exercise. So we had this beautiful sheet, and people would, you know, with espresso land. We had six rounds of about half an hour each, although we ended up only playing four because of time. And it was divided up, I should have noted this, basically into the first part would be we would present uh, what the current state of the island was. Uh, the players would have their, what cards are allowed to play with presented. They would discuss amongst themselves the actual, what action cards they would do. And then we, at the end, we would have what we called the event where we would say, right, but these are five year cycles. Okay, in the last five years, this is what happened. And depending on how they spent their cards, perhaps they did well, perhaps they did badly. Oh, and also at the beginning, inform relevant information would be provided to the players, again, dependent on the actions they'd taken in the previous round. So, for example, an information round uh, for the first one for the sign, and they would be role dependent. So the first one is, okay, especially land scientists predict this many storms, the volcano is expected to remain quiet, but we've had some less seismic activity. But depending later on, you could actually have done actions which allow more detailed information to be provided. Um, action cards, there are an awful lot of them, and they were dependent upon roles. Some role, some cards you could do with another role. So for example, retrofitting housing against earthquakes and storms, the Ministry for the Interior would play that. It would cost them four beans. The maintenance, they would also have to do maintenance, so every round, one bean. Um, and the effect was one shield. So if you could imagine, we had a number of cards like this. Ones related to the environment, you'd get leaves. Ones related to social cohesion, for example, uh, national first aid courses, that would improve your social cohesion. And they had to balance that with their budget. And the event cards at the end are... Uh, Basically, it's just an example. We would then say, okay, um, heat wave happened, so you had this many losses, but you know, if you had certain support things, you would have less, fewer losses. Uh, the con excuse me, consequences depending on the actions and the players in earlier rounds. When In the early stage, they would get this effect and thought, oh, gee, if I'd done X, it would be easier. So it would help adapt their thinking as they go through. And basically, the final number of shields, leaves, and handshakes were tabulated. The second exercise was dealing with cross-border crises. And so basically, the idea is to try to develop cross-border policies. Um, basically, they had to respond to natural disasters or maintain and improve upon vulnerability. So if you like, we also were considering the build back better issues. So we had to select the best policies to deal with these crises. Um, we had to deal with your damaged assets within the limitations of regulations and resources. Again, we use beans. And you could also distribute uh, your resources between NGOs and the European. We used here, the scenario here was this cross-border region called Barista, which was between the beautiful countries of Latvia and Makianstan. Yes, I made this up too. Sorry. Uh, basically, it's susceptible to different disasters. Each country had a different national disaster risk management policy and different cross-border issues. Um, each had a strong NGO. We also tried... One of the criticisms of the previous exercise was we didn't incorporate NGOs and the media. So, okay, in this exercise, we incorporated um, NGOs. Media, we felt at this stage, we wouldn't be able to make... Be starting to get too complex. Our next exercise, which is the end of April, we're trying to in integrate the media into such issues. And each country has a different relationship with the EU. Uh, assets were basically cities, as you saw, major. Each of these had different 
if you like, vulnerabilities. So when they got hit by an event, you had this sort of damage and you had to respond with your resources. So we basically had cities, towns, different industries. We had a bridge, which was a major transport link, and a nuclear power station. What was very interesting in this was when we started playing this exercise, one of the participants, um, a gentleman from Denmark, we're, we're looking at the power station, then he said, I think we did one round, then he said, well, actually, in reality, the population would have closed down this power station. Um, it wouldn't be realistic to keep that there. Oh, okay. So there are a few factors like that happening. Um, the roles in this case, it was a little simpler. We had, in the previous one, we had five participants. Here we had six. Uh, for each country, we had the central government that leads the policy development and how the, the resources were distributed depends if you had a centralized or decentralized policy. One of the things we didn't want to force was we didn't want to bias things towards, well, centralized good, decentralized good, or whatever. One of our colleagues has a natural bias towards decentralized. So when we started planning it, there was this bias towards that. We're bringing a bias towards collaborating across borders, but these sort of things we wanted to sort of leave open. Um, we're the local government, uh, which are basically the first responders. Non-government organizations that were also a local government, and they were separate in each country, but they could pool resources with the appropriate policy. Then we had different things, the European Emergency Response Capacity and the European Union Solidarity Fund. These, the first part is how to respond, basically assisting in the response to a disaster. And the second are the funding that goes to helping support you know, recovery of a disaster struck area. And the player, each of them were from the institutions that they played or? No, there was, were varied. It was, some were maybe from, we had Italian, <laughs> Some were civil protection, some were fire brigade. We had an uh, Israeli gentleman from um, the Israeli uh, first aid people. He came, he was taking part. So they weren't actually necessarily in that role. They weren't just. When we did the first game, what was quite nice was we had one lady from France. I forget which ministry she was in, but she was in, a, she was actually quite, do I, I don't want to play this. I think she was climate change science, and she was a bit uncomfortable about that. And she said, oh, I've never played these games, never played board games. Well, by the end, she was really into it. She really quite enjoyed it. Um, so the actual, I think when you've been engaged in some of these issues, you can sort of cotton on. Of course, it's better if you are in that role. But if you're from outside that role, you might bring what, a different... What was the purpose for you if you took people who are not connected to the role that they're going to... That was basically trying to see well, that all... Well, we, they didn't have to get completely outside, but also how would the communication build up? How could we get these things? And there was enough expertise in the table where people could inform us where some of the communicate, where there would be a problem between certain ministries in the communications. If you like, they weren't necessarily in that role, but there would be someone at the table that would know, okay, um, this communication wouldn't happen or might happen. We used a table sheet, as we see here. Um, as you see, it's divided into three parts. First of all, we start with a policy and preparedness where people would decide, okay, what policies they would have. The second part, if you like, was the map where we would just show what the disaster was. And the third, one thing we learned in the uh, first exercise was we needed to change how we recorded um, the discussions going on. So this is a way we try to tabulate, okay, how much damage happened, how many resources were spent on fixing the damage and what was the end result and also what assets were we noted down what were weakened what was strengthened and then for each of the participants we would say okay what was the motivation for your decisions here and would really try to note down why they were doing this uh, for example if we just look at a look at this here one of our points was a windstorm so we would start the session say there was this windstorm these towns here would have this level of damage in the units that we're working on. Um, for example, if you look at the points down the bottom, these are what the this represented the extra costs for the external for the central government if they needed to respond. So if you had a decentralized government in these various towns, you had would have had more resources, and so it's cheaper for you to respond than if you're the central government. 
that was one of the advantages there. But then the central government could also request extra information from the European. That, we had a number of criteria and rules for this. Um, do we have time to sort of play a little bit? I'm just going to do an experiment. I'm not sure if do we have time to sort of. How long? Five minutes? Five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Um, one thing we're going to try, I don't know if this was going to work. This something we thought of I was putting this together is this is the policy part. Now, when we start the game, this is how we set the policy. So perhaps we'll have um, uh, these people here might pretend to be uh, Mackie Stan. You are the local government or central government. Uh, perhaps Barry and Mikhail could be the local government for Mackie Stan. Oh, okay. Uh, perhaps for Latvia, you can be the central government. Uh, this pair here, the local government, European Union, and NGOs, for example. Now, when we start this, or the way we started this, we would look at these policies, and you're allowed to change a policy. Or we should say two policies. If we look at these sort of things, I'm not sure this is going to work. Um, you're allowed to, what way we did is you're allowed to change two policies at the beginning and adjust how things work. For example, um, if you look at cross border assistance, let's try to see if I read it myself. Uh, sorry. Sorry? It's hard to read. Yeah, now I just realized how hard it is to read. Um, you can have either an informal where, for Makistan, where only the local government can assist. Or it's official for the other side where the central government um, can only take part, but it costs some extra things. And the different groups would need to negotiate with each other. Um, for example, again, <coughs> excuse me, um, you could also make one of your policies a build back better, where, okay, critical infrastructure, when we recover, it actually becomes stronger. Uh, NGO support, if you press this, Basically, it says, oh, okay, um, one of the rules we had was NGOs could only work on cities. Or if you change this, you can work on towns as well, just to expand the roles. Uh, or international policy, you could actually um, allow it so they could combine the resources. And so if one area was hit harder, both NGO countries could assist with that section. But what was the motivation of giving default and change from the default? Why not like a blank uh, and then select your possibilities? Um, I think we did this they, just to get stuck. Like, tend to stay with the default. So. Uh, no, they didn't. The people often would look at it and think, okay, no, no, I don't like it. We want to do this. Or we want to add that. Yeah. Um, it, it did happen. We did it as a default. Um, the main thing was actually just to get people's – it takes a while to get started. With, you know, it takes a round to learn how to play the game. So that yeah. sort of was the motivation we would do it. One thing interesting, for example, um, in my table when we played this game, nobody bothered changing the centralized or decentralized. They were quite happy with it like this. Whereas in the other room we're playing, the first thing people did, they changed, oh, we don't like decentralized. We want to be decentralized. Mm -hmm. So you also gain some very interesting where, again, we um two Danish fellows. Some kind of reference. Yeah, basically. Exactly. Exactly. Just a, if it was just blank, people go, uh, but it was just a, yeah, exactly. And, but when we limit how many things they could change, mm -hmm. it sort of gets the, pro get the priorities going. Mm -hmm. So, you know, take, for example, again, I don't know if this is going to work, but. No, I, I kind of, maybe just explain it. Okay. So, for example, it might be easier. For example, the um, local oh, government. You want to do it? Oh, oh, I want to do it. Okay. <laughs> It's like the okay, secret sorry. of adventure. I'm the prime minister or prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Co-prime minister. Exactly. It's like the consoles of Rome. <laughs> Can I have some cigars? Absolutely. <laughs> Do you want some espresso? <laughs> so, you know, if you're looking at, say... My wife bought <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean... Get people in trouble, you know? <laughs> so, the picture, okay? Well, the point, too, is that the central government is the only one that can change the policy. Now, the local government will have to say, look, please change this. The NGOs will have to say, well, look, it'll be really good if you did this for us. Likewise, the European Union 
when they've stopped eating their canapes and champagne, will recommend, well, you know, we recommend this policy. For example, looking at the European policies, um, Latvia is engaged in it, which means they will get some support. Makiastan, you get no support from the European Union. You don't, you don't want Europe. Um, likewise, in terms of, uh, where's another one? Yeah, central, the protection organization, your decentralized system. So basically the central government gets one third of the money. The local government gets two thirds. Uh, whereas in Latvia, where you are a centralized policy, you split it evenly between the local and the central government. It's supposed to be opposite. Okay. <laughs> the one, the country that is attached to the EU is decentralized. We mix things up just to <laughs> just to keep it interesting. Okay. Um, what was very interesting was we had two Danish fellows playing um, on this one of the sides, uh, local and regional, and I think on the other side we had Italians, and straight away you sort of had this cultural difference arising straight away. The, the uh, Scandinavians straight away started discussing, well, we need community involvement. We need this bottom-up approach and so forth. Whereas the Italians were more sort of, right, you know, on the top down. So you know, straight away, these sort of national differences were appearing. How does all this planning relate to the situation in which the people who are supposed to take part in the, take the actions to protect people are also under attack? Like in our little country, we can possibly have 5,000 missiles launched a day at all the different centers of response, and they won't be able to do anything because they'll be in their bomb shelters. So how does this, this, this seems like when, you know, an assumption here is always that there's somebody who's not suffering from the event, and they can offer assistance. But here, everybody might be suffering from the event, which is good, but... It's a different type of disaster response. This wouldn't be the appropriate exercise. Yeah, as simple as that. This, this, yeah, I, I'd have no idea how to do a scenario training exercise for that. I wouldn't. Know. This, this is, this certainly would not be the appropriate exercise for that. Um, I wouldn't use this for, you know, one. Level. Again, these are sort of like for quite. Which, well, this is one reason why I actually sort of hear what input people were might have. Were you able to connect the climate change and the da disaster risk reduction? We were. That was. Because the discussions were able to come out. I can't remember the details, I must confess. But no, so those discussions were. Really nothing to do with, I mean, you know, I saw some of the scenarios. Not everything was connected. And Well, in the second one, or the second one, weren't, we weren't really looking at the climate change and the disaster risk. Uh, the first one was. And a lot of the policies there were sort of how to relate the two different groups so they could let's say there was an earthquake because we've been waiting for 100 years now mm. and it affected a large number of cities in that case you know israel is not really is not part of the eu directly but it has associations if it were to engage in scenario based responses as part of the eu but there were earthquakes you know, Jerusalem or some large mm. part of the country was hit by earthquakes, and EU members were to send help mm. or interact mm. with local members here, then what you're saying might be very relevant if we were part of an overall response to disasters and not just by ourselves. Mm. So in, in that sense, the earthquake happens, then you must respond. But when there are you know, missiles coming or you're at war, or it's, a, it's a different situation. Mm. But there is certainly room for cross state interaction. Why is it different situation? What? I don't understand why it's a different situation. Well, because it's, it's, it's hard to do, dodge, a, dodge a missile. I mean, missiles tend to blow things up. Earthquakes happen, they're done. Well, the missiles air, are on the Earthquake door. also can affect the, you know, the decision makers. Uh, Earthquakes also have other It could, but on the other hand, I, I agree that it could affect the decision makers, but it, it's a an event that happened rather than an event that's ongoing. But, it, but in the event. sense of exercising, I think once you're in the exercise and it's all about policy making and sometimes cross border policy making, I think if you build the right exercise, I'm not from the field, I'm awfully sorry if I'm talking bullshit here, but um, if you're in the process, then um, <coughs> um, it's, it's exactly the same thing. It's a different scenario, but you're the, the process itself is the same process. 
think. Um, my only answer to that is uh, that's totally at a level outside of what we're looking at. Um, so this. Don't think so. By the way, you know, you're talking for an hour almost on scenarios and games. This is the actual practice in Israel. Hmm. The home front and uh, MEMA is conducting at least twice a year or three, right? times. Hmm? Three? three times a year exercises hmm. where they exercise the real officials hmm. that are in their jobs. So there are many questions to ask about the exercise, but we haven't reached this yet. Mm. You know, what kind of scenarios is are the scenarios based on scientific findings, mm. or you just imagine things? Yes. Uh, do you want the real functioners or not the real functioners? Uh, is the exercise conducted in the midst of a disaster or as a preparation for a disaster? Various questions, and and all of these are are conducted here. Mm with the real people you know i don't understand what's the unless there is a research question for you as a researcher to mm. see how people react behavioral studies uh, under stress they behave differently okay. and so forth so uh, I, I don't understand what is the essence of conducting exercises in imaginary countries mm. you know this is really a game and not a real exercise yeah. or with not or with people who are not the functioners mm. unless you want to study something on you know general psychological or behavioral issues uh, okay I can give you two examples. I mean, one, the, these these kind of scenario buildings are, you know, imaginary uh, scenarios are used with the decision makers themselves. But I can give you an example, not in disaster recovery, but in 1999, um, the Ministry of uh, Justice and the Ministry of uh, Environment wanted to introduce... Uh, conflict management, uh, conflict resolution um, processes to, to the policymakers. Mm -hmm. And what they did was we took three real intractable disputes. One was about Dudaim, a national landfill. One was about Fishesh, which, uh, which is the major highway, uh, the major toll road now. And the other was um, Natbag, the, uh, the airport, the, airport mm -hmm. the, the new airport, which you've seen, but it, it wasn't always like that. And actually, the fourth was about building on the um, building on the <coughs> coastal line of Tel Aviv. And in each group, I mean, after a couple of days of, of talking about different concepts of uh, conflict, management, each group with the real stakeholders with the came came uh, into separate sessions. And in that case, we actually changed the role playing. I mean, we had the uh, people from the Ministry of Environment playing the uh, this no, 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 playing the industries, okay. playing the, and that, that would have been fun. <laughs> no, and that was very effective because it was an issue which they were incredibly uh, connected to. Mm -hmm. They knew an awful lot about it. So it, it was not a make-believe mm -hmm. scenario, but they had to understand the interests of the other stakeholders, which they had never done before. But this I mean, is not connected to disasters. It's and it's connected, no. it's connected to but uh, it's, it's the best using... ways of decision making and institutional structure for democracy. No, no, no. But it was using it was it was using this role playing. I mean, what yeah, Kevin was talking about yeah. was a tool for for role playing. Yeah, but role play where and that, the representative yes. of the government who knows that he's right. representative of government is that's, playing another that's role. What, play. That's what that's what that's what I'm saying. Sometimes that 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 makes sense. Here, I still I have similar questions to what Ellie asked about how you were using the who were the participants and what were the what were the goals for the scenario plan the um basically it's i mean your actual question is actually that was a concern you know we actually have people they're not involved in this and thinking about it now maybe i should have thought about it 
compared to before. But think about now, my reaction, like I said before, well, that shouldn't matter. Everyone's been involved in these issues and you can, in a sense, you're from environment, you can bring your experience in. Sort of, the, the word, we try to avoid the word, well, I was trying to avoid the word game because it almost trivializes things, but it, it effectively is. It's a, on one level, it's a warm up for the discussions we have in the evening. We'll talk about this later. Um, but it's basically, yeah, really trying to see as people do this, those involved in it, they might not be playing the role of the ministry, but they will be familiar with the communication problems. And so what we're trying to find is, no, you're right, that discussion, we never, t we would not talk to the people. So who, do you, who comes to the, who plays the games? We had, uh, just remember, we had, well, some are from, for example, the, uh, Again, well, an example is the um, the Israeli chap from the uh, Don Magdal. But I mean, is it, is it, is it, is it, are they actually, was, sorry? I mean, is, is this for like students? Oh, no, no, these are like sort of government policy makers or yeah. you know, academics in research institutes. The sensing game we could do for students that could be just quite fun. We set up the situation, and but what is the purpose of the game? <laughs> from your perspective, is from our perspective, we're trying to see where or how we could um, get the communication between the different groups, you know, between environmental ministries or disaster ministries, how we can build up these communications better. You know, where, how, if you like basically, how can we break down the walls between the different groups that deal with things? That's one point we're looking at. How we can, in the end of the month, when we do the legal and, well, policy and science one, Part of that issue there is exploring how we can communicate risk and hazard better for different people, get their people's input, how we can do this. Um, on the first admit, these exercises are very simplified, and this was the whole point. Uh, we try to make them relatively simple. We would do these over like three hours. Were you connected to the exercise that Angela Merkel uh, uh, held in the G20? Uh, no. Okay. This is a very interesting story. No, I don't know this. <laughs> you know, there was a this meeting of the G20 a few months ago in near Munich, or Hamburg, I think. And Angela Merkel said, "Well, I mean, enough for for all for enough of all these um, speeches. Let's have a game of a real disaster <laughs> with the real people." <laughs> and she she called some people to to prepare a game. I think it was a. Uh, epidemic yeah. and you know it was the chinese minister of health and uh, the iranian minister it's with the real people okay and this chinese guy who doesn't say a word without you know quoting or looking at his pre-approved text had to respond mm. And, uh, you know, there was some kind of epidemic in a small country and this country said, and the, the, regular, the real representative of the country said, well, we closed down the borders. And this was the wrong. And this was very, very effective. First of all, those people from dictatorships who don't uh, uh, spell a word without, you know, uh, pre-prepared text were much more spontaneous. Mm -hmm. They reacted wrongly from the professional point of view, they were corrected. And this might be an experience for them, mm -hmm. much, much more important than any kind of the conference and speeches and mm -hmm. the deliberations. So it's this is effect. the effect of a effect. game mm -hmm. on the real decision makers, which can be very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't come in, in the things that you actually organize, right. because first of all, it's hypothetic. It's not real countries, mm -hmm. it's not real problems. And it's not the real people. Mm. So mm. sometimes you can have a good game that's about a specific problem that many stakeholders are facing and you and you give it a hypothetical name, but the people who are playing it are the real people. Are the, re are the real people. And I think the interesting issue is that we can we should deliberate in this form. First of all, how to build the best scenario game. We don't want just imagining countries and imagining uh, disaster. We want to base our games on, let's say that there is a seven uh, 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 level earthquake in Israel. Okay. The 
people from the Technion should tell us what will be the damage, and on this basis, we should construct a game, okay? Mm. Or let's say that there is a, a, an attack from Hezbollah, 5,000 missiles, okay? We know <coughs> our capacities, mm. and on this, we could, and these are games that are played mm. in Israel. So, but, but, but I'm saying one question is really how to do the best scenario for a game and this ex and, and and for this we have this center i think mm -hmm. the a second issue concerns really uh, behavioral issues uh, how people react under stress uh, as opposed to you know general policy games uh, mm -hmm. in which we have to devise a policy and the disaster is just imaginary or you know is expected but is not imminent yet and so testing you know people's behavior and drawing conclusion mm. how to try to mitigate or mm. to balance the, the behavioral effects of mm. urgency so there are various aspects that we can talk about games as a mean to to uh, preparedness mm. but i think we have to be much more concrete on what do we want to okay. and one of, one of the other things is the debriefing after the game yeah. because games are always oh. a lot of fun to yeah. i mean not always but most of the times a lot of fun to play mm. um and but people may not understand what's happening so it's actually the ability to really debrief it mm. and to give enough time to the debriefing you're which really helps with the you're absolutely when we do these if you like the way a day would go would be we'd sort of go okay turn up have coffee introduce the exercise people break up into groups three hours we would do the exercise have lunch um they would the players themselves would present their summary of how things happen and then the evening or the afternoon that would be spending in a sense deep we try to leave the exercise behind but then okay let's get the issues that we were discussing and build on that so in a sense it's like we have a quick debriefing but then if you're in it one level you could look at these exercises as a way to get the the thought juices going and then when the afternoon session comes you know people can continue this discussion in greater detail well, um but in a sense we were what we're getting out of it i'm taking your, your now sort of your point about trying to get you know having people really involved in the thing in a sense you made a comment before about people having these exercise the uh, ministers and big people having these exercises a slightly different experience they go off um maybe we'll cover this if i continue a okay. little bit um one, one full issue oh, sorry I'm completely join uh, this uh, uh, view and comments and maybe one thing you can use uh, these setups is like a, a game mechanism design mm. so you use like people sophisticated people uh, in these uh, situations you repeatedly play the same game and improve it because you have basically one chance with the real decision makers mm. so you can use this platform to uh, basically to provide the, the optimal uh, setup mm. for the real quote unquote game which we yes. studied on the real decision makers in, in the ideal world that would we would have sort of practice sessions but the problem what practically the problem was i changing the game so you construct yeah, the game, yes. the game that you have in your mind basically will not work exactly no. as you plan it. So you can learn from it, change the rules, change the, yeah. the uh, even the way that the uh, information is transformed in uh, the tokens and the leader, etc. Yeah, that, the best. Uh, we would try to do, we would try to do that. I mean, the ideal world would in the ideal world would be you know we would have the sort of people we would want to play come together play the exercise, adapt, do it again, adapt, then the proper session where we get the ministers, whatever. Um, in the other, I agree completely. That's what you would do. Unfortunately, can't really do that. Um, we would, and we actually did, it was interesting when you actually designed these things that there was one where in the first game you had to do, we, we wanted to encourage science policies, your know, research into different aspects. That's one thing we had in mind. And when we had a practice, one of our colleagues who just decided to be annoying, he says, well, I'm not going to pay for research. Why should I pay for research? I'm not. Well, he ended up making the most money of everybody. Um, 
which is not what we intended. So that allowed us to change some of the game mechanics. Um, I think the only way I can sort of explain this is, um, you know, we, again, it's, I'll continue to see how this goes. Basically, um, we're still analyzing our results from the espresso exercises, so I won't discuss much. Um, yes, as Deborah said, um, these games are fun. People actually enjoyed the exercise. They would do it, and I remember the first one we did, um, everybody was very, we were so relieved that it worked. Um, I think we sort of shut down afterwards when they had the main discussions. But people were very, they liked it very much. Uh, you know, they had sort of mechanical issues like, well, that issue you wouldn't really deal with or, yeah, you should take this more into account. But overall, you know, people were very positive. Unfortunately, from the first one, uh, we had some problems with, um, oh, and also basically overall, even though these are make-believe scenarios, you know, make-believe countries, people thought in general, okay, they were make-believe, but they were realistic. They could have, there was one issue, I forget what it was, but one fellow was looking at me going, oh, so you're saying this would happen. I was a bit worried. I said, yes. Is that realistic? And then he looked a bit embarrassed and went, well, yes. <laughs> so I forget the exact point, but there were cases where even though it was make-believe, people felt that it was still realistic. Um, we had trouble actually from the first exercise, we um, were trying to actually how to record the actual discussions. The input, if you like, were the actual discussions. And we had trouble because we videoed it, we audioed it, we had people trying to take notes, but that didn't really actually work out very well. So in the second one, we tried to do more you know, actual note-taking recording. Um, but this is actually probably exactly what we're discussing now. You know, what do we do for follow-up? Uh, for Sensum, in the case where these, these um, exercises were more operational, one option is, say, to offer training courses in the remote sensing products or in whatever issue you're looking at. Um, offer training courses and actually that sort of follow-up. In a sense, that's easy. You know, that's something very direct. You know, you don't know about remote sensing. We will come and give you lectures on remote sensing. Done. Um, or whatever issue. Uh, for Espresso, it, the exercise form basically introduction and information gathering task before the sessions in the afternoon. One of the concerns we had is, yeah, people would come to the exercises. They said they had really great discussions. This is really good. It was interesting. Go back to the min go back to the office. You know, I should talk to the person from that ministry. Phone rings, notes come in, they forget it. So that that's and in fact, actually, this is one of the issues I was wondering. Any advice yourselves have for how we can improve the follow on for such issues? Um, yes, I suppose that's it. How do we make it not simply an interesting meeting, and how can we, you know, encourage if you like push these the barriers or whatever that we come across identify how can we push the people to actually start doing something about it in terms of the actual project itself uh from from the discussions and that there'll be a number of recommendations being made they're still being um, discussed um one point which i'm curious about you use the example of the dictatorships where they don't read from thing when we did these exercises it was full of italians germans australians israelis all very argumentative people how could an exercise like this, or how would you do a scenario type exercise in a less argumentative culture, but you know, whether it's a dictatorship or you know, say Japan, where the hierarchy and people don't want to argue so much, or perhaps if you're in this culture of disaster risk reduction, uh, people, personality types argue anyway. I'm not sure. There's something that we sort of were pondering how There's we do that. Written by the Consensus Building Institute. Okay. And you can get it online. Um, it's connected to the Harvard program on well, the Harvard program on negotiation, which is a consortium, it has lots of um, lots of material in this area, and a lot of it is also cross cultural. What? And you'll see how. Something you know, yeah, they, yeah. They've I mean, been writing about it since the 1980s. Okay, it's something I, I, I confess I haven't looked at it in great depth, but it's something we're looking yeah, at this going. That would be a good hmm, resource. <laughs> Excuse me. And basically, yeah, um, any comments or discussions will be happily 
you know, very happy to um, listen to. Um, as we mentioned, operational type exercises like Sensum seem easier to plan and implement, although given the details involved, uh, will need a much greater expertise in what we had available in our projects uh, than Espresso. So I suppose that's one thing too. We would design these projects with, there's like three or four of us putting it together. And it was meant to be simple, so we didn't need as much detailed information. But I would appreciate, I think the Germans, they do every two years, they do these series of quite civil protection exercises. And they literally spend two years preparing it. And they then you know, do these exercises. Each time they do it, it's focused on a certain issue. I think the last one was pandemics. It was actually pandemics. But then they spend years designing it, whereas we had four people in a few weeks. <laughs> um, Oh, that's it. I'd just like to acknowledge this work. Steve Platt and Emily So from Cambridge put a great deal of effort from the Sensum project. Um, our colleagues from the Espresso, from a number of institutes, from um, Hami, Laura, Anna, Lynn, Mattia, and Julio, and my colleagues at the Gear Fortune Centre, Max Batori, Boyana um, Petrovic, and Mikhail Haas. Um, and thank you very much. It was interesting. I think already. Questions. I have one. Um, you mentioned that the, there was some technological tool that actually uh, was used or developed even in order to. Um, to uh, you didn't? Uh, Not without to say, Oh, you mean as part of the Sensum project? or Maybe. Uh, to, uh, um, to, uh, to simulate the uh, part of the event or. Didn't you have any, any platform? Not, during Sensum, we actually developed um, a lot of uh, different tools for making for, for analyzing uh, remote sensing data. We were focusing on Landsat data. Well, one of the whole things of Sensum was they wanted free and open source. You know, so everything we developed was, for example, the GIS tools were all on QGIS, okay. free and open source. We used Landsat data. Okay, 30. 30 meter resolution, um, free and open source, make use. So this, this, that was the um, intention. And they developed a number of different, to, I don't, that's informatics I don't understand. But you know, things of how to recognize buildings, how to get, you know, map uh, recovery process, uh, you know, identifying, for example, uh, changes in the size of camps, identifying areas to put your camps and so forth, you know, different um, pattern recognition software. Uh, that's what our guys were developing. Okay. Uh, is that the tools you were thinking of? Yes. These are all available, and I can give you names for people to talk to. The next question that I, I think I, I understand the attitude was, uh, would be, uh, okay, if you would like to run these uh, uh, games again and again and again, what be uh, be the right tool that you need? Like, let's say here in the Minerva Center or in the knowledge, uh, so what, what type of tool do we need in order to exercise these uh, um, games again and again and again? Oh, well, the games themselves are quite simple. It's basically you've got a A0 plotter and a photocopy and a printer. You can just get the material out. I don't believe that that is the... It's, it's, <laughs> that is it's not a computer interactive game. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a computer active. It's just we basically print materials, you have paper resources, and people just do things. Um, okay. How to implement that in a computer? I think some, guys have, some of our guys have thought, you know, we should make a computer game from this. Um, that's the next stage. Okay. Next process. So my question is actually in the future. The next in the future. <laughs> Any other questions for Kevin? Kevin, thank you very oh, much. Thank you very much. It was really, uh, and it'll be interesting to hear when you. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. That's funny.